much, praise team, and I'm very happy to hear my eulogy this morning. It's good to hear your eulogy before you, you, uh, you, you die. But um, I wondered what I did is so eulogy wrong, um, because um, you know I don't like to get much long introduction, and uh, you know. When people call me doctor, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm your pastor. So call me pastor. Call me pastor. You know, that's the name I prefer you call me. But um, I must tell you folks that uh, uh, pastoring this church has helped me to be a better person and a better pastor. And uh, so I want to thank God for bringing me to Wilsden. Uh, so that I can grow with him and, um, and, and become a better minister for the gospel. Well, this morning, I know we have the Matthews family here. Can you just stand where you are, the Matthews family? Okay. All right. I, uh, the Matthews family um, having, have lost uh, their dad. And I know you're about to travel back to Jamaica. Um, so, so I want to pray for you before you go with, uh, to lay your dad to rest, uh, that God will strengthen you. And as a church family, we will continue to pray for you. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, let me just pray for you right now um, for God's peace and grace. Let us pray. Uh, Father in heaven, this morning, we thank you that you are a God of comfort. There is grief in the sanctuary. The Matthews family are grieving the loss of their dad. We ask of you, O God, at this moment that you will draw close to them. Only you know what is happening in their hearts. But you are the God who can take our broken hearts and mend them. So I pray this morning that you will embrace the family. Walk this lonely journey with them. I thank you, Lord, that you are the God of all comfort. As they get prepared to go to Jamaica, take them safely. And let them know that there is a church family that will continue to stand with them in prayer. We ask, oh God, that you will give them your grace and your strength and help them to know that weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. So into your hands, I pray that you will encircle the entire family, those here in the United Kingdom and those abroad, and help them to trust in you and to trust in the blessed hope that we share. Of Jesus' soon return, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And we'll continue to, to pray for you as, you as you travel back to Jamaica. I also want to um, say this morning that uh, let's continue to remember uh, those of us, uh, those who are hospitalized of our members, Ella Allen, mentioned them to you, but I just want us to keep praying for our members um, this morning. I received news that Brother Butcher uh, came out of the hospital, but he, yeah, you know, so, so let's um, continue to pray for Brother Butcher as he, he as God uh, keeps him on the mend and getting him better. Our message this morning is one of the more interesting messages I've prepared. And um, I enjoyed um, preparing this message. It's entitled, Guess Who's in Church? You know, um, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Guess Who's in Church? Let us pray. Father in heaven, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart's heart be acceptable in your sight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On the Sabbath, 
one of the best places you can be is in church. I don't know about you, those of you listening to me on, uh, uh, online, but Sabbath is special. And in fact, not just Sabbath, but those of you who are online, you are missing something not being here this morning. There is something about being in church that online can give you. No, no, I have no problem. I have no problem with being online. If we have to be online, that's okay. But nothing meets seeing a real smile. <laughs> you know, and, and, and getting a real handshake. <laughs> Jackie. And a real hug. Sister Yvonne. Nothing beats that. You know, Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, not let us go online. No, no, no I'm not preaching against online this morning. I'm not preaching against online. I, I, you know, I'm just reading the word of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go where? Into the house of the Lord. <laughs> Uh, Psalm 84 and verse 10 says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand years. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tent of wickedness. Listen, folks, church is not perfect, but it points us to a perfect God. Uh, church is not free from problems, but it provides a community a support network of believers that can share your joys and your sorrow. I know some of you say, but pastor, what's about the, what about the hypocrites? Well, can you tell me anywhere in the world there are no hypocrites? Hypocrites are everywhere. We just learn to live with them, and we better do, because... I've got news for you. The hypocrites are not leaving church anytime soon. And so, I'm not going to leave church because of the hypocrites. You see, folks, church attracts people. All kinds of people. In church, you find people of all cultures. All races. Different ethnic backgrounds. The rich, the poor. You find people who are happy People who are sad. People who like to hug you. People who don't like hugs at all. People who like to shake your hands. People who don't like handshake at all. You find people who are lovable and hospitable. But you also find those who are cantankerous and inhospitable. Listen, church have it all. I want to let you know if you can come to church and survive in church, you can survive anywhere. <laughs> You can survive anywhere. Uh, you know, in church we have people of all different temperaments. You've got the melancholy temperaments. People who do not need much socialization. And so you may see some people in church and you may think they're stuck up. They don't like to talk, but that's just their temperament. I've learned that you must not draw conclusions on people when you see them. Some people are sanguine. When you see them, they will run and greet you and hug you and make you feel welcome. But there are some who are very reserved. And you may think that they are not nice, but they are nice. You've just got to get to know them. You see, folks, we are not all the same in church. We are different, and sometimes I find we try to make everyone the same, but we cannot all be the same. Some will be quiet, some will be loud, some will smile, some will not smile, but we need everyone in church. That is what makes church a church. Guess who's in church this morning? You see, I've learned that people come to church for all different reasons. Not everyone who comes to church comes for the same reasons. And so I want to give you a picture of some of those who come to church. Jesus, in, before he went back to heaven, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, until they received the Holy Spirit. They were to reach out to Jerusalem and and to Judea, and to the uttermost parts. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
Judea and Samaria. The church in Acts was a dynamic church. Members were, 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 uh, were loving. Members were aided by the Holy Spirit. They were reaching out to their community. The church was what every church would like to be. There was evangelism. There was welfare. There was everything happening in the church. You see, folks, when the Holy Spirit takes control of a church, it will be church. You know, what makes church, church is not programs and preaching as good as those are. What makes church, church is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as I look in the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 8, our scripture reading, guess who showed up in church? The first person I want to introduce you to, yes, you know him very well. He's called Saul of Tarsus. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. And Saul approved his execution, referring to Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made a great lamentation. But Saul of Tarsus was ra ra ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Saul of Tarsus, he was not Paul yet. He was an unconverted religious fanatic. Yet he believed in God. You see, folks, there are a lot of people who believe in God. But if you lack the Holy Spirit, Satan can use you to destroy the work of God. Saul's unconverted life reminds us that some people join the church under the guise of conversion. But let me tell you this, folks. Satan plants people in church. Now, I'm not here this morning to throw stones at anybody. But the devil knows that if he cannot fight the church, he will join the church. And, you know, Saul reminds me that there will be folks who Satan will plant in the church to spy on the church. Now, let me tell you this, folks. As we near the end of time, some among us will give us up. As we near the end of time, the church that you now see would not always be what it is. You see, folks, Saul reminds us that there are some in church whose agenda is to fight the work of God. Obstruct the progress of the work in the name of religion. Interestingly, folks, interestingly, Saul was learned in the scripture. Yet, Saul stood and commanded the execution of Stephen in the name of religion. Religion, as good as it is, doesn't always make people right. Don't think because you are reading the Bible and you are doing good things that the enemy cannot take control of you. And that's why it's so important, members, that we get to know Jesus through the Holy Spirit. You see, the syndrome of Saul of Tarsus is prevalent in many churches. Because sometimes, if the devil cannot get against us, he puts us against ourselves. How many churches where members are in the church and not talking? Come on, listen, brethren. How can we be in church, going to heaven, and we vex? Can you imagine that? I mean, we are on our way to the kingdom, and we cannot talk. I've done you something wrong and I cannot forgive you. You think that's the work of the Holy Spirit? No. The devil, folks, 
he wants to put us against each other. Folks, your brother or sister is not your enemy. Pastor is not your foe. Satan is our enemy. Sometimes he takes our eyes off him and he puts us against each other. It doesn't matter what we do to each other. We ought to love each other. It doesn't matter what happens in church. we got to get it right and move on. Because we are not fighting each other. We are fighting Satan. I think sometimes we become so preoccupied with tearing each other down. You see, Saul should have been building up the kingdom of God. But Saul was used by Satan in his unconverted state to destroy the church. I want to say to you this morning, if you are not controlled by the Holy Spirit, you're in trouble. If you are not controlled by the Holy Spirit, you can commit treason on God. Only the Holy Spirit can keep you together. And that's why, folks, I want to just challenge us this morning uh, that, that we don't want much soul of Tarsus in church. We don't want anyone giving away the name of the Lord. We don't want anyone tearing down each other. We want to build up each other. I'm not saying that problems are not in church, but what I'm saying this morning is that when the Spirit of God is in us, we will recognize that there is more that unite us than divide us. We have more going for us than what's going against us. It doesn't matter how rough things get in church. Stay in church. Stay in church. Now Saul um, saw Stephen being persecuted. Uh, Stephen was martyred. And that brought a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. It began with his death. And then it broke out with a ferocious storm as Paul, Saul, went from house to house, dragging the Christians out and committing them to prison. Actually, the word there suggests that he was committing them to death. Uh, The persecution was scattered throughout Samaria. But what Saul did not know is that the more you fight God and his work, the more it grows. You cannot keep the work of God down. In fact, folks, what we do not understand is that, uh, you know, if you want to see the church progress, try to fight the church. If you want to see a spiritual man grow, try to fight him. You cannot kick against the prick. I want to say to you this morning, folks, that this church is not built on human hands, in human hands. It is not built on human foundations. I know there might be some of us doing foolishness in the church. But folks, the church is built on the, on the rock Christ Jesus. And even though it looks feeble and defective, it is still in the hands of God. That's why I say this morning that Saul sought to destroy the church, but he only made it grow faster. You see, what the devil doesn't understand is that persecution serves as flames for the church. And I want to tell you this morning, if they want to see this Adventist church grow, try to bring the Sunday law on. If Listen, brethren, let me tell you something. You think persecution will, will kill the church? I know a lot of us are, oh, the COVID-19. Let me tell you this, brethren. You know, if, if we want to see this church go, grow, bring the fire on. Bring the trials on. Persecution acts as fuel for the gospel. I know you are wondering, when will the church grow? We'll say, Lord, bring the persecution on. No, you don't want to pray that prayer, ain't it? Bring the difficulties on. Bring it on. Listen, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that when persecution starts, watch this church grow. Because the more you try to stifle the church, the more it will rebound. The more you suppress truth, it will spread. This church is waiting hard times. Hard times ain't come yet, you know. It ain't come yet. 
But fear not. In the midst of trials, this gospel of the kingdom will move on. But Saul was in church and Saul reminds us that there are some who will join the church so that we can grow through hard times. The second person, guess who's in the church? The second person to join the church was Philip. Acts chapter 8, verse 4 to 8, our scripture reading says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him, they saw the signs he did for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many. Now, folks, Stephen and Philip were two deacons in the church. They were not apostles. They were not appointed by the conference. Philip was a deacon, and the deacons in those days didn't collect offerings. The deacons in those days give out food to those who are in need. But they were preachers of the gospel. They were evangelists. They were performing great signs. Luke, in fact, when Luke saw, uh, you know, he, he portrayed Philip and Stephen as men who were filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, the evangelist Philip, they proclaim, he proclaimed the gospel to the Samaritans. And uh, the Samaritans, you know, we're going to talk about them in a while. But I'm, I'm very fascinated this morning that Philip, a man who was not one of the twelve, rises to the occasion. I know you think the work got to be finished by the apostles. I'm sorry, the pastor. I want you to know the deacon will do it. No, I'm not talking about the deacons in church. I want you to know that the work will be finished by the person you think can do it. Philip reminds us that God can and he's waiting to use anyone. Now, The likes of Stephen and Philip in the early church doing great exploit reminds us that you don't have to have title like apostles or degrees like Paul. They were ordinary deacons, yes, but they were spirit-filled. Let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. Officers in the church, your position is not what gives you power. In fact... I want to talk to my officers this morning. While you are appointed, that's only a name. Your real function lies in the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you this. A pastor is a title. It means nothing if you lack the Holy Spirit. And I've come to recognize That the people who will do the most for God are not those who are appointed, but those who are anointed. We need more leaders who are anointed. We have too much appointments and disappointments. We need more men and women who are under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When that happens, you will see what the church will do. You see, the challenge we face today is that the church puts a lot of emphasis on titles. I know I have no problem with titles. But everyone today is doing degrees. Everyone wants to be called doctor. Some folks, if you don't call them doctor, they vex. 
because they think you are disrespecting them. No, I, I have no problem in giving you your title. But hear me out this morning. Your title means nothing if you lack the Holy Spirit. And I'm afraid that we have graduated doctors of religion who lack the power of the Spirit. Uh, you know, folks, we have more PhDs and D means in our churches today than ever. I wish we have doctors in the spirit. This will transform the work of God. This will make the work go forward. We have prioritized on academics. No, listen to me. I have no problem with academics. But I'm saying that if academics become primary and the anointing of the Holy Spirit becomes secondary, the church will be no better off. What moves the church is the Spirit of God. I hope Alan invite me to preach again. <laughs> no, I enjoy this message, folks. This, this, you know, I, you know, you know, Philip, Philip. What I love about Philip is that he, he didn't see his role as just giving food to the widows. Philip sought the Holy Spirit. He was not an apostle, but he recognized he didn't need a title. Members, you don't need a title to serve. You don't have to wait for a nominating committee to serve. If you have the Spirit, you will go and witness. The church don't have to plan a program for you to witness. If you are waiting on a program, it means you lack the spirit. And that's the challenge today. Everyone wants a program. Plan a campaign. You don't need no campaign. Find someone and share the gospel of Jesus. Go into your neighborhood. Take a truck. Take your Bible. Go on the train and witness because you have the spirit. Philip, Philip was not appointed by the Jerusalem council. Because you see, folks, Philip understand that ministry doesn't begin with an, uh, an appointment. Ministry begins in the spirit. Listen, folks, the diagnosis of the church is simple. We lack the spirit. See, folks, when the spirit takes control of church, it will be different. It will be different. Not only will some be working hard, we will all be working hard together. Now, spirit's ministry, Philip's ministry confirmed that you don't have to be part of the 12 apostles to do the work of God. None apostles can still work. Philip reminds us that the primary function of every born-again believer is not to serve in a position, but the primary function is to spread the gospel of Jesus. Every deacon, every deacon, every officer of the church should preach. Now, you may not have the guts to stand here and preach as a pastor, but you can still preach because the loudness of your voice is not what makes you a preacher. Uh, the eloquence of your words is not what makes you a preacher. What makes you a preacher is the depth of the anointing you have. And if you are anointed by the Spirit, your life will be your sermon. That's why Philip went about doing miraculous signs. It was not Philip. It was the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus said, Jesus said in John 14, he said, he who, he who be, believes in me. And folks, every morning I am reading that text. Jesus says, he who believes in me, greater works than I did. Jesus said, we will do great works. He who believes in me will do the works that I do. And greater works than these he will do. Folks, the power is still available. Philip was doing miraculous signs, healing the sick, casting out devils. Listen to me, folks. The church can still perform miraculous signs. <laughs> you know, the Spirit of God can still heal. Listen to me. Brothers and sisters, the church is not weak. 
The church is not impotent. The church has power. And I wish tonight, this morning, I wish I say night. I don't know where I get night from. But I wish, I wish that we can bring more people to the Lord and claim deliverance on their part. Because there is still power in the name of Jesus. You know, how folks we we sometimes are so sympathetic and you know, you know and so apologetic. Oh, you know, we wish no listen, but the spirit of God can do it. And sometimes God does not do it because we don't believe it. Philip was doing great works for the Lord. What a man, what a man. Jesus says, Whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do. Churches are needing more. Members like Philip, Holy Ghost filled members. Members who are not waiting on pastors to tell them what to do, how to do it, when to do it. I'm searching for more Philips in church. I don't want to see much souls of Tarsus. I want to see Philip, people who are on the move, people who are moving with the Spirit, in the Spirit, by the Spirit, people who are not waiting on instructions from a man, per persons who are taking instructions on their knees. By God, through the Holy Spirit. That's when the church will move forward. I know we say, oh, send us a dynamic pastor. That's all right. But folks, what will move the church is not the pastor. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. When he takes control of this church, I want to know the pastor gets into the background and the spirit takes foreground. He leads the church and we follow. Philip, he's in church today. There are some Philips in church today. I know there are some Philips in Wilsden today. People who are doing what they have to do under the anointing. Guess who's in church? There's a third group of members in church. They are called the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. The Bible says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he proclaimed Christ to them. Did I hear you say Samaria? Philip went to Samaria. Adventists don't preach in Samaria. <laughs> we don't go to Samaria. It is hard to believe. Philip went to the Samaritans. Now, let me just give you a brief little history. Uh, the Jews and the Samaritans had a long history of hostility for over a thousand years. It began when the kingdom broke up in the 10th century BC and the tribe, 10 tribes defected, uh, making Samaria the capital and only two tribes remained loyal to Jerusalem. It became uh, a, a very bitter conflict between the two and um, in the 6th century when the Jews returned, they refused the help of the Samaritans and the Samaritans and the Jews, they're actually cousins. They are related to each other, but they were despised. They were called the, the, the reprobates. They were called the heretics. The Samaritans, they were the outcasts. The Samaritans were the untouchables. The Samaritans symbolize our community where we don't want to go. The gospel must be preached to the Samaritans. The church is not just supposed to preach to those who are lovely. And beautiful. I know we like pleasant people coming to our church. People who can well polish and put away. Well groomed. We like the socially acceptable coming to our church. The morally upright. Listen to me. We like those who have gained immunity from temptation to come. Oh, those who can preach like Paul and pray like Elijah and have the patience like Moses. But let me tell you something. Church needs some Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans in church, they may not look like Adventists. Yes, you heard me. The Samaritans are the unsaved. The unchurched. The socially scorned and rejected. Yes, the church is for those who don't sing our songs and eat what we eat and dress like we dress or even believe what we believe. The gospel must go to people we don't like. And I know that the reason why the community is not in the church is because a lot of us don't want them. You see, 
if the community comes in here, we'll have to make a lot of adjustments. Are you hearing me this morning? If the Samaritans come in church, I have to give up my favorite seat. And I may not be able to park the car where I used to. If the Samaritans come to church, I may not be able to be appointed to the same position I, ha I love. But you see, folks, it is very easy to run the church with only Jews. Because we understand each other. We know how we move, you know. We know how we do things together. But when the Samaritans come in, they may not do things like us. Listen to me, folks. It is uncomfortable to preach to the Samaritans. That's why Peter did not want to go there. Because Peter was a Jew. He called them unclean. I'm saying to you this morning, the church need to reach out to the quote-unquote unclean. The gospel is for everyone. The gospel is not for some. The gospel must reach to people who are unreachable. And let me tell you this. We don't preach to fix people. You know, I myself, I've been, I've been on a journey as a pastor. Because as you preach to people, you think they should get better immediately. You didn't hear, I just preach and tell you what the Bible say. And you're still doing that. Let me preach it for you again. Preaching don't fix people. And sometimes we get angry with people because we preach to them and they don't change. But what we don't understand is that God did not call us to fix people. The Holy Spirit can do a much better job. I need to take people to Jesus and leave them there. Leave them there. Now listen to me. It may be uncomfortable for me as a pastor. Knowing I told you the truth and you're still not doing it. But that's all. I gotta leave you in the hands of God. <laughs> you see, folks, I have found, and I, I want you to know this morning that the sermon is gonna get a little interesting in a while. Because you see, sometimes people don't always respond the way we think they should respond. But Philip, Philip understood that you must go to Samaritan. You must go to the Samaritan because, you see, folks, somebody need to tell the drug addict. Somebody need to tell those who have alternative lifestyle. Are you listening to me this morning? Church must be a place where everyone can hear the gospel. I cannot choose who I want to tell the gospel or who I want to save. Everyone should get an opportunity to be saved. And I wish the day will come when our churches can become refuge places for the Samaritans. They may come in not dressed like Adventists. They may come in and make me uncomfortable. But I'm glad they came. You see, they didn't have to come. But the fact that they came, it tells me that the Spirit has something to work with. Listen, brothers and sisters, I wish that we can tell the community, come as you are. Ah, you know, yes, we want you to change, but take your time. You know, things don't happen immediately. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. I mean, a lot of us still have struggles. A lot of struggles that nobody know. But we are still here. We need to open ourselves to the Samaritans. Let me move quickly as I end this message. Now, Philip preached to the Samaritans. And I want you to guess who's the next person who showed up in church. Simon. Simon. Magus. Let me quickly tell you a little about Simon and 
begin this message because actually this message is really about Simon this morning. Uh, I wanted to get there quickly, but you guys had me all over the place. <laughs> you guys had me all over the place, but we really we were going to speak about Simon this morning. So let me get to Simon quickly. Acts chapter 8, verse 9 to 13, there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic, and everyone called him great. They paid, they paid attention to him from the least to the great. This man, the power of God, is called great. They called him great. He made a lot of money. So uh, Simon heard Peter, uh, uh, Philip, if you please, and he said, wow, wow. Um, Simon had great respect among the people. Um, and Simon saw what was happening. And the Bible said, he too believed and was baptized. Now, Simon was an Obia man. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm telling you how we say it normally. I mean, I mean, don't, 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 I mean, don't polish it up. He's an he's a Obia man. We call him night man, a magician. He's an Obia man. He walked in voodoo and witchcraft and all of this. And Simon said, if I learn these tricks from you, Philip, I mean, that could deepen my pocket. <laughs> you know, so let me, let me come and tell you I believe. And get baptized. But in the back of my mind, I want to learn what you're doing. Because that could deepen my business. It could, it could enlarge my fortunes. Um, you see, Simon was in awe of what Philip was doing. He loved the miracles. He, he loved the belief, the teachings. He loved the health message. Um, let me tell you this, brethren. Um, people are in awe of the Adventist church, but awe can bring them in. Awe will not keep them. You know, um, people are in awe. Oh, you guys are so good in health. Oh, you guys have such good programs. Oh, I love the Adventist church. Oh, can bring you in. But oh, ain't going to keep you. <laughs> you know, you know, listen to folks. You know, you know, Simon, oh, look at what you're doing, Philip. Oh, 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 Philip, how are you doing this? Oh, Philip, I'm telling me too. Oh, can get you into the pool. But all ain't going to keep you. You see, when it comes to your salvation, folks, it takes more than awe and amazement to keep you. Simon came in with the crowd, recognize, not recognizing that the crowd may bring you in, but only you can stay in. And the Bible said, when Simon saw all the miracles, he was amazed. Now, there are some people who come to the church because of what they think they can get. Some join the church because they believe there are some benefit you can get from it. Not everyone. But there are some Simons in church who are in the church because of what they think they were going to get. As a pastor in the Caribbean, when we had campaigns, we used to be giving people food and um, cooking every Sabbath during the campaign and even after the campaign we would say let's keep the food being cooked for six weeks and as soon as the food stopped cooking the numbers started dwindling and then finally you end up with very little and i recognize uh, or sometimes we used to pay for the transportation to take the people to the church and as he said all right we can't pay anymore can you pay a little bit on your own the numbers start dwindling i recognize some people will come in because of what you have there are some Simons who are in awe, but they see people in the church with nice cars. You know, a nice dress and suits. Oh, this church must be a church that people have money. So maybe if I join them, some of the blessings will rub off on me. And my children, listen to me folks. I'm not saying that the church should not help people, but the church main purpose is not that. And if you come in because of what you think you're going to get, you'll be disappointed. Come in because you love Jesus. And God will take care of you. Don't come in depending on anyone or on the promissory note of anyone. Come in because of Jesus. Now, Simon was in awe, got baptized. And 
um, when he got baptized, um, you know, uh, the interesting thing is that Simon experienced a moment of conviction. Now, what is interesting here is that Philip knew Simon was an Obia man. Philip trusted his conviction. Philip didn't say, show me all the books you have. Let me burn it first, and then I go baptize you. Philip said, Simon, are you sure? He said, yes. Philip said, I'm going to trust you. You see, folks, as preachers, we have to trust people and leave God to deal with the heart. Simon's heart, Philip couldn't read, only God. But Philip got him baptized, not knowing that Simon had some ulterior motives. See, Simon wanted God's power to advance his fortunes. And the Bible said, um, my final passage this morning, Acts 8 verse 18, Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying of hands. So he said to Peter, he offered them money, saying, give me this power. So that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon thought that you can buy spirituality. Let me tell you this, brethren. If the Holy Spirit was something that money could buy, then the poor would be in trouble. Simon's episode was in the Bible, is in the Bible to remind us that what you own has nothing to do with the power you have. You can have all the fame and wealth in this world. That does not mean you have the Holy Spirit. You may have a beautiful voice. That doesn't mean you have the Holy Spirit. You may have a loud voice. It doesn't mean you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot be bought or sold. He must come in through your surrender. And that's why Peter said to Simon, your heart is not right with God. You came in because of what you thought you're going to get. But God must transform your heart. I know there are some people who are still disappointed with the church. Angry that you did not get what you thought you should have gotten. I don't know who told you what before you joined the church. But the church is a place where you get power from God. If there is one thing the church can promise you is to give you the Holy Spirit. That's the only promissory note you have from the church. And when you have the Spirit, you have it all. This morning, folks, I want you to know the Holy Spirit wants to show up in church. And fill the lives of members so that we can become transformed by his grace. Guess who's in church? The Holy Spirit is in church. He wants to transform us as a people. He wants to transform our lives. This morning, brothers and sisters, I cannot stop saying this. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So that he can transform the souls of Tarsus. He can transform the Samaritans. He can transform the Simons into spirit-filled men and women under the anointing. Today, I don't know which category of member you fall into. But the spirit is available. Peter said to Simon, go and confess to the Lord so that he can heal you. This morning, God wants to do something in somebody's life. He wants to do something in this church. We have not seen the best days yet of Wilson. The best days are still to come. And it is still to come because the Spirit is still waiting to fall. This morning. Philip was willing and 
and ready. If there is one person who is willing and ready, God can fall on you. The Spirit can fall on you. He doesn't need a church full of people. He needs a Philip who he can send to Samaria. I don't know this morning. I don't know. I know we have a Philip in church. I don't know if Philip is here. But there are many Philips listening to me. You want to say, Pastor, by the grace of God, I want to be that one person that the Spirit can feel that I can go to my Samaria. This morning, if you've heard this message and you want to say, Father, I am willing to be that one person. Just raise your hand where you are. God bless you. If you really mean that this morning, why not stand to your feet as I pray for you? And I'm just feeling inclined this morning to ask someone to make a radical commitment. A radical commitment. You want to make a commitment this morning. You want to say, preacher, by the grace of God, I will step out in faith and go where no one will go. Do what no one will do with the power of the Spirit. I want someone this morning, even if you're just one, a man or woman, anyone, you want to just make a commitment to the Lord this morning to, to just be that person that he can use to turn your community upside down. If there is one person like that this morning, just join me at the altar. Just join me. Who, whoever you are. Whoever you are. God bless you. I thought there was one, but we have more than one. God bless you this morning. Amen. Oh, folks, God, God only needs a few. And here he has them this morning. Praise the Lord. This work can go forward with you by the grace of God. Thank you for your commitment this morning. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Let us pray. I want you to take one minute and just pour out your heart to the Lord. Those of you who are online this morning as well, take a minute and pour out your heart to the Lord. Uh, you may want to just send us a message and say, Pastor, by the grace of God, I too would like to be in that number. I would like to commit myself to the Lord fully. Go online and sign up that decision card this morning. Why not take a minute and pour out your heart to the Lord before I pray for you? Father in heaven, this morning, oh God, we come before you in humility. Oh God, we have been waiting as a church for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Father, at this moment, I want to ask that anything in our lives that will hinder the moving of the Holy Spirit, that you will please, oh God, remove it. Father, let nothing stand between us. But this morning, you have called some Philip, some men and women with the spirit of Philip to accept the call to become spirit-led, spirit-driven. This morning, oh God, I want to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, in the upper room, you came down and you rested on each head like cloven fire. 
Father, this morning, I don't know how you're going to do it. But in the name of Jesus, I want to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we need the Holy Spirit. We are powerless without the Holy Spirit. Baptize us anew with power from on high. We need a fresh anointing to go forth and do the work. We have exhausted our energies. We are weak, Father. That's why this morning we come asking. You said that you are more willing to give the Holy Spirit than parents are willing to give gifts. So I pray this morning that you will pour out your spirit on this church. That the anointing will rest upon every member, particularly those who've come to the altar this morning. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will raise up the Pentecostal power that moved the early church in Samaria and caused men and women to be baptized. This morning, Father, I pray that this power will rest upon Wilson. We need the anointing to go out into our neighborhood and finish this work. And so today, oh God, come into our hearts. Flood into our hearts. Feel our hearts today so that we will leave church empowered. We will leave church motivated to go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you this morning that the anointing is in this place. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. Rest upon your people today. Baptize us anew with power from on high, we pray. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen. 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 You can go back to your seats in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Time we'll have our closing song.